Noblesville hits the billion dollar mark. Investments, housing, and companies staying put. Why it all adds up to economic success for Indiana's 10th largest city. The smooth sounds of Resonato. The Notre Dame connection and details on a new partnership with a global name in audio. From epic commercials to priceless billboards, how this tiny craft brewery in Fairmount, Indiana, has blown up, amassing a huge following among Hoosier beer drinkers. And a new immersive art experience at the Loom in Indianapolis. This time, it's Monet. Inside Indiana Business starts now. Hello and welcome to Inside Indiana Business. I'm Gary Dick. Full transparency here. We are recording our show on Thursday, July 14th, the same day Tom Leinbarger announcing that he's stepping down as CEO at Cummins. And uh, you are looking now at video of the announcement coming out of the company's global headquarters uh, in Columbus. There's Tom Leinbarger. He's been in charge at Cummins since 2012. Will leave his role as CEO August 1. And there she is taking over as CEO, Jennifer Rumsey. She grew up in Columbus and has been with Cummins for more than 20 years. Uh, not long ago, was named president and COO. She'll be taking over uh, August 1. We're going to be following up on this story throughout the weekend. Check InsideIndianaBusiness.com for more information. Now on to our other big story this week. Economic momentum in the heart of Hamilton County, in the county seat of Noblesville. The city has hit a record $1 billion in private uh, committed capital since 2020, basically two and a half years. For more on what's driving growth in Noblesville, pleased to be joined by Mayor Chris Jensen. Uh, Mayor, uh, welcome to the show as Gary, always. Gary, great to be here. Thank you. That's a big number, a billion dollars in private investment uh, in basically two and a half years. What's driving the growth? You know, I think uh, it's an exciting time, not just for Noblesville, but I think central Indiana as a whole. Indiana is in a healthy e economic state right now. I think the pandemic threw everyone off their game a little bit. But uh, two and a half years ago, Noblesville made a decision that we were going to lean in to the investment in our community. We were ripe for um, opportunities to come to our community, and we've mm -hmm. really leaned into that mission of uh, taking our city to the next chapter. So we're excited to be a part of it, and a billion dollars is something we're really proud of. You can't mention all the projects. Give us some highlights, though. A couple of areas. Downtown is getting a lot of investment, residential mixed-use uh, development in downtown and some other areas You know, I'm well. excited because it's not just in one area of the city. You know, we, we announced over $145 million of private public investment in downtown Noblesville in 2020 in the three rows of a pandemic alone. Yeah. Um, but you're seeing, you know, a, a million or $150 million investment along um, the 37 corridor with Washington Business Park. You're seeing um, a project there on the I-69 corridor at exit 210 uh, with about a nearly $200 million investment. So you're seeing it all over our community. But we've been heavily focused in downtown to attract new um, residents living and working and playing in our downtown. And we're excited to see that growth. Uh, life sciences and advanced manufacturing, two areas when it comes to business attraction and retention that you're seeing investment in? Yeah, I think you're seeing the entire state focus on those areas, yeah. but particularly Hamilton County. Um, even some of our neighboring communities have really leaned into those, those different industries. But life sciences, advanced manufacturing, SMC Corporation, which I know you're very well familiar with, our largest private sector employer in Noblesville, they're continuing to grow. You're seeing different groups along the I-69 corridor, uh, Curium Biopharma, for example, uh, and a, a Noblesville-based business that's continuing to grow. So we're not just seeing new businesses come to Noblesville, we're seeing businesses that have called Nobles a home for several years continue to double down on that investment. With growth for many communities come challenges. You've got to yeah. keep up with growth, the infrastructure, all those types of things. I know something you have talked about is uh, managing that growth, but also keeping uh, kind of the, the history, the authentic nature uh, of Noblesville. I said from day one, we have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Noblesville is turning 200 years old next year, our bicentennial. Um, so not only do we have the historic charm and the um, unmatched authenticity that makes up our great community, but we're also growing. We're now the 10th largest city in the state, as was said earlier, 70,000 residents call Noblesville home. I firmly believe that we can continue to grow into a next level city while also maintaining a great hometown feel and, and being a city really for everyone. 10th largest uh, uh, city in the state. You mentioned 
uh, 70,000 residents now. You think that can double? I do. You know, Noblesville um, is about 50% developed currently. So we extend all the way from the Westville border on Gray Road all the way out to I-69. We are now um, under a new sewer agreement. That's the fun stuff you get to deal yeah. with as a local <laughs> leader, flushing toilets. Um, under a new sewer agreement out on the east side near our friends at Ruoff mm -hmm. uh, Music Center and Exit 210, where we'll continue to see major investment, not only in the corporate campus and great companies coming to Noblesville, but residential as well. So um, I truly believe that we will over time probably double our city's population but we have to manage that going forward and that's a trick well you you bring up an interesting point and that's the available land yeah. because you know fishers in westfield and and in carmel uh, certainly get a lot of attention for the growth and deservedly so but uh you have a lot more it sounds like you have a lot more land a lot more available inventory if you will to, to market we do and you know but one of our administration's big focus is making sure that we do that properly and we manage that properly going forward you know today's economic data as you well know better than anybody with such a low unemployment rate we have to be very strategic on how we grow what type of businesses we're, we're attracting to noblesville we have one shot to get that land right going forward and we're going to be very strategic about that what is going to be key in your view going forward to keeping that momentum going and how how, how much does the state's strategy, uh, economic development strategy, play into that? A huge role. I think you've seen Governor Holcomb and Secretary Chambers really double down on the investment of really quality of life investment in, in Indiana. I think any business owner, any city will tell you that we need more people to call Hamilton County and Indiana home. Mm -hmm. We need more workers in Indiana. So we're going to be investing heavily on the White River, for example, which flows mm -hmm. through downtown Noblesville. Yeah. The red excuse me, the Ready Grant spoke perfectly to that, allowing us to invest in uh, new quality of life initiatives. Um, so I think that the state strategy and our strategy is very much in line going forward, uh, but we just have to look really at quality jobs that really represent the city of Noblesville and also the training available in Noblesville to skill up the next generation of Hoosier workers. A billion dollars in private investment uh, in Noblesville. Mayor Chris Jensen, uh, as always, thanks for joining us. Thanks, we'll Gary. talk to you soon. Appreciate it. All right. Well, the first family of forecasting in central Indiana, Bob and Kevin Gregory are my guests on the next Business and Beyond podcast. 50 years, that's how long Hoosier TV viewers have relied on either Bob or Kevin to get them through the best uh, or the worst of Indiana weather. Bob, a fixture at WTHR in Indianapolis for nearly three decades before retiring in 2000. Kevin followed in his dad's footsteps. He's been delivering the weather forecast at WRTV since 1989. Both reflected on how bonding the uh, audience, bonding with the audience has changed over the years. His generation bonded with people is events. Um, yeah. Super outbreak of 1974 tornadoes. Yeah. The blizzard of uh, 1978 was a moment where, again, um, people couldn't search 80 channels. And those are moments that people remember family events, what they were doing during the blizzard of 78, and certainly TV was a part of that. I always thought it was important somehow during the course of the broadcast, if it's visually or it's something you say, is to leave people smiling or a happy note somewhere, no matter what all the other stuff is around you, you know, hopefully there's something positive and something you can smile about and you move on. Much more with Bob and Kevin Gregory on the next edition of the Business and Beyond podcast. To check it out, just go to InsideIndianaBusiness.com. Next, a little music for your ears with an Indiana connection. Born out of Notre Dame's Innovation Park, Resonato Labs finds a new vibe with one of the leading high-end speaker companies in the world. Details coming up next. week sound of success. Resonato, a startup founded at the University of Notre Dame, hitting a high note with a global audio leader in technology. Resonato and Indianapolis-based Klipsch are partnering to produce high-end audio technology like the market has never seen or heard. For more on the evolution of sound and Indiana's role in it, I'm pleased to be joined by Resonato President Chuck Lukesic. And uh, Chuck, uh, I know you're in San Francisco now. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. 
Absolutely. Hey, uh, we'll talk about this partnership with Klipsha in a moment, but I think the Resonato story uh, is an interesting one, obviously with an Indiana connection. We've had uh, some of the founders on the show in the past, founded at the University of Notre Dame, uh, three undergrads there at, at uh, or students there at Notre Dame, founded the company. Give us the background uh, of uh, Resonato and the, the uh, flat uh, speaker technology. Cer certainly, yeah. So Resonato was started by, uh, by, by three friends at Notre Dame, uh, three great guys, three of the most brilliant people that I've ever worked with. Um, yeah, they took this, uh, this technology, um, you know, which we call, we call uh, you know, fl the flat core speaker, um, that was originally uh, invented by uh, um, uh, one of the fathers of, of, the, of the founders uh, and was uh, uh, assigned to the company uh, in order for these guys to build on top of. Um, you know, they took what was a nascent idea uh, to uh, to change the audio industry uh, and develop it into a company, uh, and the you know the manifestation of that uh, you know is the is the Resonato Rescore driver, which is uh, you know central to the partnership that we're doing with Klipsch. Um, you know the the innovation in itself uh, really comes down to to what makes the speaker uh, and what drives sound, and that's actually the speaker driver. Um, you know speakers are, are complex systems, uh, but at its core, the the speaker driver is you know arguably the most important part of any speaker system. Yeah, and, and you know, I th what I think is interesting, they made the point several times that speaker technology, kind of the speaker industry, has really not changed much for decades and decades. It's been rather stagnant. This is a radical change uh, you're offering uh, to the industry, really. Certainly, yeah. I think you know the the, the home audio specifically, uh, you know, has changed dramatically in the last uh, you know in the last uh, you know 50 years. Uh, the you know uh, the heyday of the hi-fi uh, is over. Um, you know that that that. You know, space is constrained for a lot of people in their apartments, uh, that people want to have sound in every room, uh, and the desire for smaller form factor speakers uh, has really pushed, uh, you know, pushed the industry uh, in a new direction. Uh, Resonato's technology is core to helping uh, you know, companies like Klipsch uh, solve and overcome the problem uh, and the challenges of, uh, of using what is you know, used for most yeah. of the industry, the conical, uh, the conical speaker driver, what? which you recognize as the volume button on, your, on, you know, on any device. Uh, that that driver is great in hi-fi system and large scale and large form factor speakers. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't perform nearly as well uh, in smaller form factor speakers like soundbars. Yeah. Uh, the Resonato, uh, our patented technology, uh, actually changes the the dynamics of, of speakers and allows us uh, to to push full frequency sound. So to create lower lower end uh, frequency in an all in one package and integrated uh, integrated systems for uh, for speakers. Hey, uh, Chuck, what does this uh, partnership mean for Resonato? You're still in startup mode. Company's headquartered now in Chicago. Give us a, a, a quick 20-second synopsis on what the partnership with Klipsch means for Resonato. Yeah, for us, it's a chance to really push our technology forward. Uh, it's to work with a partner who uh, has a you know, tremendous amount of experience in market penetration uh, and you know, to, 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 to keep transforming uh, our technology uh, and making it useful uh, you know, and uh, enjoyable to listeners everywhere. Big news for Resonato, a company you founded at the University of Notre Dame and growing now. Chuck Lukesic is the president. Chuck, thanks for joining us and good luck going forward. Thank you. All right. Well, you've probably seen them, those billboards showcasing dirty socks, tidy whities everything bad about dad. A strategy behind Fairmount-based Bad Dad Brewing Company's marketing campaign when we come back. Here's what's making news now around Indiana. Well, Fairmount, Indiana, is synonymous with Hollywood legend James Dean. But a father and his two sons have been on a mission to put the small Grant County town on the map for another reason, beer. Around Indiana reporter Mary Rachel Redmond joins us now with the ongoing success story of Fairmount's Bad Dad Brewing Company. Well, just the name alone is reason enough to fall in love with the Grant County Brewery that truly personifies what's so unique about running a family owned business and Bad Dad. Well, it has quite the story. Here's a look back at my original story with the boys from Bad Dad that we shot in Fairmount during the height of the pandemic. Started when brothers Patrick and Derek Henry were growing up. You know, when everybody else was out on family vacations and, and such during the summer, uh, we were working. All the, the, the good dads let their kids have fun and ours makes us work. And that bad dad is Barry Howard. 
the namesake of Bad Dad Brewing. A corporate man for 20 years with a side hobby, home brewing, something he happened to be pretty good at. You start at home, it's a lot of fun. You make people smile and then suddenly, gosh, how can I do this bigger and larger? And, and that's just kind of how we get started. And his sons thought so too. So much so, they decided to go into business together. So like a lot of people, it starts from being a home brewer and then saying, you know what, I can do this. And enough people telling you that you can. Well, it just so happened that he makes awesome beer and he was able to teach uh, Derek and I to be able to do that as well. Uh, we're a family of entrepreneurs being able to have us start where he left off, being able to grow and do our own thing. And perhaps it's the dadisms on the cans themselves that make them stand out. Tapestry of obscenity is special to, to Bad Dad. Why is it, that? It's, uh, it's actually a reference to a Christmas story. In the heat of battle, my father wove a tapestry of obscenity that, as far as we know, is still hanging in space over Lake Michigan. Now, also on these cans, you said there's Bad Dad jokes? Yes. Okay, read me one. What do you mix an elephant and a rhino? No idea. Elephino. <laughs> And it's actually the pizzeria part of the business that's boosted Bad Dad's beer sales, even getting them some international love. We got uh, recognized in Pizza Today, which is the largest pizza magazine in the United States, and it is distributed internationally. And we were uh, put in there as one of the featured destinations, which was a really big honor for us. Fun to get the name out there from such a small town. And don't let the name fool you. This bad dad couldn't be more proud of his sons. Uh, so as a dad, obviously that makes you feel really good. So they definitely have the entrepreneurial spirit and um, it's the kind of thing where uh, you don't have to tell them what to do, they know what needs to be done. So it's a lot of work, but there's a lot of pride that not only you can see what you, what you create, but then see your sons to participate in that as well. So. And working with dad isn't so bad. Love my dad. <laughs> So what's new with Bad Dad Brewing since our last visit? A lot. The beer brand has taken off. For anyone that's on the road, it's nearly impossible to miss these epic billboards peppered all over interstates around Indiana. And that's not all. There's also commercials. Oh, and if you're curious as to who the model is, his name is Clint and he's a native of Indianapolis. And no, he's not the actual bad dad the Howards grew up with, but a genius marketing ploy, perhaps, but it's all part of continuing to build the bad dad brand and it's working. I caught up with co-owner Patrick Howard to talk about the rapid growth he's seen over the last year and a half. With, with this rapid growth, um, my dad always puts it uh, to me where um, you're you're diving into a pool and you're filling it up at the same time, right? And it, it's it's growing alongside um, this rapid growth. It's a, it's a hustle. Uh, you're you're trying to figure out um, uh, right now what can I do to situate myself in in the most optimal position, um, and and as you go forward, trying to create these systems. Um, to be able to keep up with the demand. And to keep up with that demand, Howard tells me they've ordered more fermenters and are hiring even more staff. They're also in the midst of upgrading their tap room. So a lot going on, and if that weren't enough, they've got a new slate of billboards and commercials coming out in August. Well, in 2016, Indiana was near the bottom when it came to cybersecurity. But in the last few years, the Hoosier state is being recognized as one of the leading states in the country. Cybersecurity sounds intimidating, but it actually affects each and every one of us, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, online banking, email, you name it. What's even more and really what affects everyone and what's so alarming is that small businesses and their employees are especially at risk because personal and home technology use has completely changed the security of businesses of all sizes. It is so important to know that everything you're using in your personal life, cyber, bad, bad, bad cyber actors are absolutely leveraging what you're posting in your personal life and then they were using that in your in your work life. So it's no longer a world where when you go when you leave work you go home it's just two separate areas. Who's your business owners who want to learn more this week the Indiana Cybertech 
Midwest Conference 2022 will be at the Indiana Convention Center, and you can learn a lot more about cybersecurity. Well, for a look at more Hoosier headlines and stories around the state, visit our website at InsideIndianaBusiness.com. All right, Mary Rachel, thank you. Well, there is a new immersive art experience in Indianapolis. Next, we dive into the Monet exhibit at the Loom at New Fields. Look at the economic impact and how it's attracting a lot more visitors to Indianapolis. Well, if you want to immerse yourself in the works of one of the greatest artists of all time, then we have a perfect spot for you. This month, the Loom Indianapolis at New Fields launched its newest mesmerizing art experience, highlighting the talent of famed impressionist Claude Monet. It comes on the heels of the wildly popular Van Gogh uh, immersive ex exhibit at the Loom. And for more on what the Monet exhibit is all about, Pleased to be joined by Newfield's Director of Marketing and External Affairs, Jonathan Berger. Jonathan, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Uh, the Loom, uh, what an attraction. The largest continuous exhibit space in Newfield's history, right? Yep, 138 years of, uh, 139 years. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, 30,000 square feet of projection space on our entire fourth floor. Okay, uh, uh, Monet, uh, it, it started uh, first of the month, uh, early mm -hmm. July. Mm -hmm. Give us the, the uh, synopsis of what this is all about. I know it's, it's I've talked to several people mm -hmm. who've been there and sure. they came away very impressed. Uh, yeah, it's a fully immersive experience that, uh, you know, as soon as you walk in, you're overwhelmed by the, the magnitude of these images uh, being projected all around you, uh, walls and, and the floor. Uh, don't miss the floor, because it's amazing. Um, and, and along with that, uh, there's aroma, uh, and then it's uh, a musical score that goes along with it. So it, it's fully immersive. We even have a French cafe inside that you can stop off and uh, uh, get a cocktail or a charcuterie yeah. board. Wow. Uh, and I mentioned the Van Gogh uh, mm -hmm. exhibit uh, last year. This mm -hmm. is a different experience. Absolutely. Right? You, know, uh, you know, Van Gogh's Van Gogh's life was a little more tragic. And mm -hmm. so you, you felt that. It was an intense experience uh, where uh, Monet and Friends Alive is lighter. It's lighter weight. And that's that whole impressionist movement, getting outside, uh, mm -hmm. you know, enjoying, uh, enjoying the outdoors. Yeah. Uh, uh, museums, cultural uh, attractions are businesses, too. And, and this uh, uh, is part of a strategy to attract people. As, as we were talking before mm -hmm. off mm -hmm. camera, you said last year you saw a lot of new people coming in. For the yeah, we, we, we introduced about a quarter of a million people to our museum. Wow. And, uh, and some of those were from out of town. Some of them had never been to new fields before. And so we're really happy about that. And from a business perspective, uh, for Indianapolis, I'm, I'm really excited about that because it brings people to Indianapolis uh, from out of state. And uh, if we can get somebody that, that comes into town, maybe stay an extra night at a conference that they're, they're attending or bring their family, they stay an extra night in a hotel, maybe dine out, uh, that helps the economy of not just Newfields, but Indianapolis. And, well, and so much talk about talent attraction and retention, and whether it's Van mm -hmm. Gogh or now Monet, mm -hmm. uh, is a cultural piece that helps that process too and helping mm -hmm. Indianapolis get that talent here that, that we need. Oh, absolutely. And and it's I, I always look at Indianapolis as one of those tipping points that, you know, people are like, oh, I've got to get there. I've got to mm -hmm. I've got to you know, I've heard great things about it. And the loom can be can be that it's just another reason for people to come and 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 live in Indianapolis or come here on a vacation. OK, uh, the Monet exhibit, uh, very much an immersive experience. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us how long uh, folks have to, to be able to get out there and check uh, it out. tickets are on sale right now. And uh, this is almost a full year. It will go to Memorial Day weekend of next year. Jonathan Berger is the Deputy Director of Marketing uh, and uh, External Affairs at New Fields. This is a fabulous exhibit. Thanks for joining us and good luck. No problem. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, ahead on our next half hour, a big boost for Bloomington's economy. Why Catalan is expanding its pharmaceutical footprint in the Monroe County community and the impact it could have on the entire region. Bloomington gets a big economic boost. Details on expansion plans for Catalan, a rising player in the healthcare world, and the impact on Monroe County. Plus, new opportunities for minority students in central Indiana inside a new school tailored to the Latino and immigrant experience. 
And the Crispus Attucks basketball teams of the 1950s changed Indiana High School basketball forever. And no one was more responsible than head coach Ray Crow, the Tigers' mentor and fearless leader on and off the court in the face of racism. Why the legendary Attucks coach is in the national spotlight. The second half hour of Inside Indiana Business is next. Well, New Jersey-based Catalan is within days of opening the first piece of a major expansion at its Bloomington operation. Since acquiring the site from Cook Pharmaca about five years ago, Catalan has poured some $500 million into the facility. Business of Health reporter Kylie Valletta has more. Kylie. Thank you, Gary. This most recent expansion is a $350 million investment and is expected to create 1,000 jobs. Catalan's work in manufacturing the COVID vaccines helped spur the growth. The company expanded for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, again for the Moderna vaccine, and now a third growth spurt that relates to a variety of projects. And joining me now to tell us more about this most recent expansion is Andrew Espejo, General Manager at Catalan Bloomington. Hi, Andrew. Welcome to the show. Hi, Kylie. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So let's talk about the expansion in just a minute. But first, um, give us a quick refresher on Catalan and the work that it does there in Bloomington. Sure. Thank you, Kylie. Catalan is a contract development manufacturing organization. We have a global presence. And here in Bloomington, uh, we support over 160 molecules that we manufacture for over 65 clients, 18 of which are uh, some of the top biopharmaceutical companies in our industry. Um, we support uh, our medications, support over 35 indications across infectious disease, oncology, cardiovascular disease, inflammatory disease. 80% uh, of the uh, products that we manufacture are biologics. And our site has won multiple ISPE, in, uh, the International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineers uh, Facility of the Year Awards. Recently, uh, just this uh, uh, past spring, we won the Facility of the Year Award for our, our new facility here, affectionately known as Building C. All right, let's talk about the expansion, $350 million. What new capabilities will it give you? Sure, this $350 million expansion or investment will add additional drug substance, drug product, um, fill finish capabilities, our secondary packaging, uh, and our quality control labs. Essentially, we'll be building out uh, more capacity uh, with the, for the capabilities we currently have on site. And this is, will all serve to grow the, the demand that the industry has for biologic development and for, for manufacturing. Uh, specifically, these, uh, these expansions, this investment will include um, two bioreactors, two syringe filling lines, um, packaging lines, syringe inspection machines, freezers, cartoning machines, auto injector device assembly, and like I said, the quality, the expansion of our quality control capabilities. All right, let's talk about talent, 1,000 jobs, not a lot of uh, expansion announcements come with that kind of number. What are your thoughts on talent? I know you're in progress hiring some of those positions, so um, is it tough? How's it going? It, it, it's in our environment today. It's not easy, but we are making very good progress. Uh, we have a, a great talent acquisition teams, both here at the site and our corporate headquarters, uh, sponsoring job fairs, um, researching, uh, finding candidates, both within Monroe County in the Bloomington area and without. Uh, we offer great competitive salaries. Um, we also do a lot of work with the uh, universities to bring co-ops and interns in our, in our hire to develop programs, to, you know, grow that talent within uh, within uh, the, the four walls of Catalan. Uh, it, it is a challenge at times, um, but we're, we're seeing very good progress and we continue to work hard to attract that great talent to this area. Yeah, a lot of challenges for a lot of people hiring out there right now. Andrew Espejo, General Manager at Catalan Bloomington. Congratulations on the growth and thank you for being on the show today. Thank you very much, Kylie. Appreciate it. Have a great afternoon. You too. Gary, back to you. All right, Kylie, thank you. Well, three-term Evansville Mayor Lloyd Winicky has decided there will not be a run for a fourth term. Winicky says he won't run for re-election in 2023. He served as mayor of Indiana's third largest city since 2011. When he made the announcement last week at the Pagoda on the riverfront with his wife, Carol, and Oliver, one of his two grandsons, 
As for what's next for Winicky, he says he doesn't know, but it will not include politics. It's time now for Eye on Education. A much needed new education option for immigrants in Indianapolis. The Monarca Academy is preparing to welcome students this fall at its new location near Lafayette Square International Marketplace on the city's northwest side. It's an area where there's a large Latino and immigrant population. And for more on what the Monarca Academy is all about, pleased to be joined by founder and executive director Francisco Valdiacera. Francisco, welcome to the show and congratulations on the new school. Thank you, Gary. I know this is about, uh, it's really inspired by the Latino and immigrant experience. Give us a thumbnail description of the Monarca Academy. Yeah, so Monarca Academy uh, breaks barriers to education for all students. Um, we are uh, doing that through three foundational values. One is ganas, which means perseverance, and that means high academic expectations. Two, orgullo, which means pride, which goes in line with our social cultural, pro cultural programming. And three, comunidad, which is community, and that's the community schools model. Public uh, charter school, uh, and I know you're going to be enrolling students entering the sixth grade, and that's that's coming up, right? Yes, in two weeks we're opening our doors, and we are right now enrolling. So if you go to our website, monarchacademy.org, you can enroll right now. Talk about the uh, the Latino and immigrant experience. You bring those ex real world experiences uh, to bear uh, from your history, your your life. Yes, so I'm a first generation immigrant and uh, college graduate. And so with this lived experience and my career experience, uh, we've, taken the, we've taken that to codify uh, what works in education through our three foundational values that I just explained. Certainly the Latino population, the demographic uh, is growing uh, in Indianapolis. What's the need uh, that you see, the demand uh, for the Monarca Academy? As we saw with the results that came out with iLearn this week, uh, we know that uh, there's a long way to go when it comes to education and you know our profession. However, uh, when it comes to the Latino immigrant experience, we sometimes have some of the lowest, achieve, uh, lowest mm -hmm. achievement levels. And so this is one way to address that. Now you've got a number of partners, Indianapolis Public Schools, but also La Plaza uh, will be uh, providing services as part of your overall package. Yeah, our anchor partnership with La Plaza is really what helps us fulfill that mm -hmm. community, that, that community uh, school model. Uh, with the health and social services that La Plaza will provide for our families, that will allow our students to really focus on actualizing their potential. And again, uh, you'll be enrolling in, in just a matter of a couple of weeks. In two weeks, yes, yeah, so come on over. All right, Francisco Valdiacera is the founder and executive director of the Monarca Academy. Uh, Francisco, thanks for joining us and good luck with the school. Thank you so much. All right. Well, anyone who's paid attention to Indiana weather over the past 50 years is familiar with the name Gregory, as in Bob and Kevin Gregory, the father-son forecasting duo, are my guests on the next Business and Beyond podcast. Since 1972, one of the Gregories has helped guide Hoosiers through wind, rates, sleet, and snow. Kevin has been delivering forecasts at WRTV in Indianapolis since 1989. His dad, Bob, spent nearly 30 years at WTHR in Indy before retiring in 2000. One of the uh, things Bob is best known for, well, the Gregory Wheeze. <laughs> okay, so showers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there were just certain things that happened that, again, you try to bring the audience in with what's going on. And I remember some of the kids that Kevin was going to school with, they'd say, oh boy, did you see your dad last night? It's a late <laughs> news or something. And Kevin would say, no, what happened? He was always afraid I was gonna get fired. Yeah, yeah. I hated it. But he, they, they would egg him on, whether it was yes. Tom Cochran or Don Hine would oh. be doing certain things to get him to laugh because they knew once he started, he couldn't stop. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, I always, it made me nervous. And so we're totally opposite that way. It's not possible, I don't think, for me to lose it that way. And that's the way he is in real life. Um, yeah. You want to hear what it sounds like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's outstanding. In today's, today's world, I probably wouldn't get through the three, first three hours. Much more with the first family and weather forecasting for central Indiana. Bob and Kevin Gregory on the next edition of the Business and Beyond podcast. That begins Monday. To check it out, go to InsideIndianaBusiness.com. 
Well, next, much deserved national recognition for an Indiana basketball legend, the late great Crispus Attucks High School coach, Ray Crow. This proud daughter joins us to talk about her dad's latest honor. Well, Ray Crow, the trailblazing, barrier-breaking Indiana high school basketball coaching legend, was recently posthumously inducted into the National High School Hall of Fame. Bill Benner has more in this week's Inside Indiana Sports. Bill. Thanks, Gary. And that legend is none other than Ray Crow, who guided the Indianapolis Christmas Addicts to back-to-back -back state high school championships in 1955 and 56. He is the first Indiana coach to be inducted into the National High School Hall of Fame and to say that recognition is long overdue is a vast understatement. And joining us today to discuss her father's legacy is his daughter, Linda Crow, and it's wonderful, wonderful to have you on us along with us, Linda. Great to see you. Thank you. You were in San Antonio July 1st for the induction ceremony, and that had to be a tremendous thrill for you and, and your family. Thrill is exactly what it was. It was wonderful. Um, I want to thank Bruce Howard and his committee for making our um, trip there, just fabulous. Uh, the induction ceremony itself was, I, it was just, I was, had tingles the whole time. Um, such an honor for him to get this award and um, both my brothers, well, the whole family, but my two brothers and I are very, very proud. And the first Indiana coach to, yeah. to get this distinction. I mean, that's, that's tremendous. Absolutely. He's uh, been a trailblazer all his life. <laughs> and this was just another, another um, accolade for him. Well, you mentioned another accolade because uh, the spring he was award, uh, they had a name, <coughs> uh, award named for him, the IHSAA Excellence in Leadership Award. Right. And again, Excellence in Leadership. Yes. That says Ray Crow. And that will be awarded to a, a high school student every year going forward. Um, and that was, this year was the first year for that was just recently named. Linda, why, why, why all this now? I mean, again, I said the opening, long overdue, I think. Long right? overdue. I mean, <clears throat> 19 years after his passing, this is all happening. And I, I don't know why all of a sudden this is, you know, Ray Crow, Ray Crow, and this and that, and the school and the honors, or the, the um, national honor and the um, everything. I just all of a sudden, and then I don't know why, but it's it's wonderful. I'm very proud. Yeah, you, you referenced the school. There's a school in Clark Pleasant <coughs> Township that's yes. named after him. That's where the Crow family grew up. Right. He was one of ten. Yes. You say that's how he learned teamwork. Everybody <laughs> teamwork. had to be on the, on the, on the Crow he team. He was born onto a team. He had uh, seven brothers and two sisters. So, yeah, it was... Um, it was a team and it was always a team effort and I think just growing up with that environment working together and and helping each other and and, and all of that was just ingrained in him from the beginning. Great college career at Indiana Central now you Indy yeah. uh, and again we mentioned his, his <coughs> coaching 179-20 record a 49 a 45 game winning streak at Attucks mm -hmm. and I remember watching those teams when I was a kid <laughs> they were they were phenomenal with yeah. them, led by Oscar Robertson. Right right Absolutely. I mean, I, I was a baby at that time, so I grew up hearing the stories. So, I, you know, people ask me, well, what did you think about it? I was like, well, I didn't think anything because I wasn't aware, you know, while it was yeah. happening. But I grew up hearing all the stories from the players, Hallie Bryant, Oscar, Willie Merriweather. They were all like kind of like uncles to me and my brothers. Linda, we got about a minute left after his coaching career. City County Councilman, a member of the Indiana House of Representatives, Director of the Indianapolis Parks, uh, and Parks Department. Yes. Ray didn't stop. He didn't stop. He's always been a community servant and loved it. And that was just, that's what he did. That's what he does. He was um, loved Indiana and loved helping and doing things for the city. Well, one of the great honors of my sports writing career was, was uh, having a long conversation with your, <laughs> with your father. He, if I think of one word that epitomized Ray, gentleman. Yes, gentleman. absolutely. Yes, he was always a gentleman, always referred to as Coach Crow or Mr. Crow. People never called him by his first name. I think that was just a, you know, a, <clears throat> an honor to him that that's the way he was referred. Even his players, it was always Coach or Mr. Crow. Well, Linda, it's gr wonderful to have you on the program. It's wonderful to see your father getting, as I said, these long overdue honors. I agree. And uh, we wish you nothing but Thank the best you so much forward. for having me. I appreciate You're that. You're welcome. Rick, Gary, back to you. 
All right, Bill, thank you. Well, it has been nine years since a passenger plane landed on the runway at Gary Chicago International Airport, and that's probably not going to change anytime soon. But former Indiana Congressman Pete Visklosky, who now serves as chairman of the airport authority, is bullish on the future of air travel there. Last month, the GCIA announced it will resume independent management, operations, and development at the airport, which puts it in a position to be independently operated. Passenger service uh, at the Gary Airport came to an end in August of 2013. State lawmakers preparing to consider Governor Holcomb's tax refund proposal, chemical shortages hitting Indiana farmers and a deeper dive into a data breach affecting Indiana health care providers. Some of the stories our partners at the IBJ are working on this week. And let's get right to it with managing editor Greg Weaver coming to us from the IBJ newsroom downtown. Greg, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, a lot has been made. Your special session uh, coming up uh, later this month. Lawmakers expected to take up uh, Governor Holcomb's idea uh, for a tax refund, $225 or so uh, per Hoosier. Uh, Hoosier, but not all uh, lawmakers are on board, right? That's right. There are a lot of uh, lawmakers who think that that $1 billion surplus that the governor wants to return to taxpayers could be used for other things. Uh, particularly paying down the $9 billion obligation to the state teachers retirement fund and protecting against uh, a future economic downturn. Yeah, that will be interesting to watch that debate unfold at the Indiana State House. Cyber attacks, cybersecurity, such a huge issue across uh, all industries. And I know you have a piece coming up uh, this weekend in the IBJ focused uh, extensively uh, on cyber attacks against healthcare providers in Indiana. That's right. Millions of people across the country have been affected by these cyber attacks, and some of those have happened in Indiana. Most recently, a vendor uh, providing services to IU Health has been attacked. And then in the last year, we've also seen attacks at Eskenazi Health and Johnson Memorial. All right. Uh Final story we want to talk about, Indiana farmers. It's always a, a challenge uh, for farmers. Uh, the ultimate entrepreneur, uh, I think, they're facing weather challenges, whatever the case might be. This year, chemicals, the access and ability to get fertilizer and other chemicals posing a real challenge. Yeah, like everyone else uh, who's been facing supply chain challenges, farmers are not uh, immune from that. And the war in Ukraine is really impacting that uh, because that's the place where a large of the a large part of the world's uh, nitrogen supply exists. Very good. Three of the many stories in this weekend's edition of the IBJ. Greg Weaver, as always, thanks for the update. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Gary. All right. Well, coming up next, our Indiana Insiders panel in studio with us for perspective on leadership changes, a big leadership change at Cummins, and uh, the other big business news this week. Well, it's time now for a deeper dive into all things business in the state with our insiders panel this week. Uh, very happy to be joined by Hathaway Strategies President Anne Hathaway. Also, Winston Terrell Group pr uh, Principal Robin Winston and Trendy Minds Chairman and CEO Trevor Yeager. And welcome one and all to the insiders uh, this week. Thank Great you. to have you all in studio uh, for a change. Um, uh, big news late in the week. Uh, from Columbus, uh, Cummins announcing a leadership change that I think surprised a lot of people. I know it kind of took me by surprise. Tom Leinberger stepping down uh, as CEO. Jennifer Rumsey will be taking over. She was announced as president and COO, I guess, less than two years ago, but a transition uh, that will take place uh, shortly, August 1. Uh, and your take. Oh, exciting. A female CEO, mm -hmm. yep. Hoosier born, Hoosier educated. Um, I think it's a great move for Cummins and for Indiana. Yep. Yeah, I think Jen has a great track record at, at Cummins. I mean, she's she's well, well qualified for this position, and it is wonderful to see a female CEO, especially in a male-dominant industry, and just CEOs in general. Very, Yeah, very much male-dominated yes. industry. You bring up a good point. Uh, Purdue grad, grew up in Columbus, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and it, it, neat to see an Indiana marquee company with obviously a plan, a succession plan, and, and, and having it play out. And an Indiana company with an Indiana CEO. Right. Yeah. I mean, right. so this is somebody that's going to know how to get to downtown Indianapolis yeah. without a GPS. <laughs> that's going to be beneficial to us in the future, too. Yep. A uh, lot of news uh, with development going on around the state. Uh, we had Mayor Chris Jensen from Noblesville on the show earlier uh, at the top of the, uh, the, top of the show. A billion dollars in 
in private capital investment in a little over two years in Noblesville. So, you know, Fishers and Carmel and Westfield get a lot of attention. Don't sleep on Noblesville. I mean, they are doing, there's a lot, a lot going on there. Well, there is, and they have the land to continue their development. Yeah. Also, Riverview Hospital is fantastic for them being right there. Come through town, you have to detour because there's downtown development. The mayor is doing it in a reasonable, practical way. And is that, and he brought that up in the interview, that the challenge is he wants to grow and continue to grow, but it also needs to be in the right way because to keep Noblesville's uh, vibe, if you will. Absolutely, the culture, yeah. the, the tone of Noblesville, he's very respectful of that, but wants to continue to add population and for to see the city grow. Yeah, I think you're seeing that around uh, Indiana and as well as around the country too, that you're gonna have that other populations that are changing because of influx of people and opportunities. It's a nice shift of what's going on. So I think if they keep their eye on that, but still open to all the opportunities, it's really gonna help uh, the city of Noblesville. And you talk about growth. He said that the population now I think is 70,000, which is the 10th largest city in the mm -hmm. state. He thinks it can easily double. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and they have the room to do it. Yeah, they have the room to do it. Uh, let's go to Northwest Indiana, uh, Robin Pete Visklosky, longtime congressman who has done uh, so many things for that region on a number of uh, levels, among them, the South Shore uh, extension, the expansion, uh, cutting down the commute time to downtown Chicago, that is now becoming a reality after many years. We talked to him this week and he talked, now he's at the airport right. uh, doing some things there. He thinks that the uh, uh, South Shore activity is just the tip of the iceberg for what can happen in Northwest Indiana. They're gonna build stations in Munster, they're gonna build things in Dyer, they're gonna be opening up a way to get to Chicago faster. The airport has stabilized itself, they moved the railway that was there was an impediment they're now talking about marketing and putting more signs on the interstate to highlight yeah. the airport. He truly is a public servant, you know, served in Congress since 84, coming back to his hometown to give back as, as the chair of the airport Do board. you think it'll happen, what they're talking about? It sounds, I mean, all the pieces seem to be in place, but we've heard this before, Northwest Indiana, you know, there's a gateway to Chicago, you've got this big economy up there, but it just hasn't happened yet. There seems to be momentum and enthusiasm that this is the time that it's going to happen. It will and it will happen at the airport because Midway is landlocked, it can't do anything. O'Hara is swamped, so this is a perfect place for corporate jets to come in. The Boeing CEO used to fly out of there, Michael Jordan used to fly out of there, the president used to fly out of there, so I mean it's getting itself on the map in a great way. And if we look at how airlines is, is changing, the private air is up 30 percent, where an industry mm -hmm. used to grow four to five percent, they're looking for other easier airports to get in and out of too. There's right. a lot of people up in that region that you know if they start looking for quick trips they need to get to, whether it's for business or even for pleasure, yeah. I think that it could really have some wins there. Well and let's not forget there's land around that airport that's available for development mm -hmm. as well. So there are new opportunities there. I think the other thing I would point out, Gary, is that there's a relationship between a Republican governor, a former Democrat congressman, um, mm -hmm. and there's real opportunity to do this um, without the partisan in input and, and make change. That's, you know, and that's a great point because listening to Pete Vizklosky in the interview we had uh, in the Inside Edge this week, he talked about that, talked about the governor, and, you know, it was, it's nice for a change <laughs> to hear, you know, people from mm -hmm. differing parties kind of get along and talk, talk well, along. Yes. And have a vision. And have a vision, mm -hmm. yeah, shared vision. Uh, let's go to Northeast Indiana now, now. The regional partnership there out with a strategy for the 11 county area. Uh, there's so much going on so in that part of the state. Fort Wayne, I think there's as much going on downtown and around Fort Wayne as anywhere in the state. And what has impressed me is the fact that there's a plan up there mm -hmm. to get people there, mm -hmm. to get talent there, to attract it and, and mm -hmm. keep it. Those 11 counties are just booming. And to mm -hmm. the point we made with regard to the other side of the state, there's a plan, there's a vision. and. Uh, uh, thinking about the future, thinking mm -hmm. about where people live and what they're, how they work, what they do. Um, real opportunity. Yeah, and they need to do that. Uh, every other state is, is buying for people to move there. I mean, and, and with the pandemic, we're now seeing that people can work from anywhere. Mm -hmm. So now we're not just landlocked into one area saying you have to be here for your job. You can go anywhere. So yeah. you need to have more amenities. That area, I'm, I'm from just north of there in Michigan. Um, so I, I yeah. traveled in there know, quite yeah. a bit growing up yeah. and just through life. And there's a lot of natural resources that are there. There's a lot of great lakes. There's, there's things that are close. I think there's a lot to offer um, from, from those, uh, those counties. You look at the thing that's going on with the electric works downtown, yeah. mm -hmm. and remember with streets like Harrison and the streets downtown where they mm -hmm. built out around the baseball stadium, mm -hmm. built housing, people are like, why are they doing that? Now you see that was a precursor to where we're more moving in Fort Wayne. Once again, bipartisan. 
Tom Henry is the mayor of, of, mm -hmm. of Fort Wayne, working with people all around him that are clearly not of the same party, but for a better purpose. Yep, uh, only have about 30 seconds. And what was your take on Lloyd Winicky? Mayor of uh, Evansville, three terms, not going to run for a fourth. I think it caught a lot of us off guard. Uh, yeah. He's been a great mayor and done so much for Evansville, so it's going to be interesting to see how that political landscape develops. All right, we'll be following that story and a lot more. Anne Hathaway, Trevor Yeager, Robin Winston, thanks for a great Insiders panel. Thank you. And Thank we'll you. be right back after this. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. You know, it's summer in Indiana, a great time to check out all of the beauty the state has to offer. We leave you this week with a trip to the Indiana Dunes National Park. Thanks for joining us this week. Go out and make it a successful week.